Alrighty, thanks Andy, and good morning everybody. Good morning. So, um, just for the record, I'm a New Yorker. Right now. Born in Brooklyn. Graduated of PS 181. Oh, that's <laughs> all right. So, and I'm still, I'm still here, still live in New York, although I lived in Indiana, outside of Purdue, for 20 somewhat years, doing research and work on rodents. But my wife and I are back. We're here, okay. And I'm going to go like a New Yorker. So you know the expression is in the New York minute. Right? We go zoom zoom. And so to start us off, you know, I'm going to go zoom zoom. Now, all the speakers, we've been chatting over here on our little speakers table today, and we've been talking about what everybody's going to cover and some what. So we're going to build on this concept of this evolution into where we are now, and we are there, as you just heard from all the product specialists. It's a revolution in technology, it's a revolution in education, it's a revolution in attitude. So that's where I'm going to kick this off in that direction. And as, and as Andy mentioned, and I'll just say, I ran the route in New York City and Long Island for three years full time. I had no idea what I was doing the first couple days, I'm telling you. And I was put down in the sewers at that time. We were baiting sewers, literally. I was going down into sewers and hanging baits for rats. So to this day, I'm still working from time to time in the sewers. That's the truth. I'm still inspecting sewers, I'm still looking at catch basins, I'm still worried about different populations in those sewers and what it means. But that's where I'm coming from. All right, so let's jump in, let's get started here. I want to start with this quote. There is nothing about a caterpillar that tells you it's going to be a butterfly. Isn't that true? And isn't that amazing? No one would look at a caterpillar and say, oh, that's going to emerge as this beautiful, you know, butterfly with colors and, and, you know, gorgeous stature and fly away. But what Fuller was getting at back in 1974 is everything is changing, especially now. We're going at a very fast rate. And so the question would be, for each of us in this Pest Expo, to do some introspection, ask yourselves, what are you going to be in two years? And notice I didn't use five years, I didn't use 10 years, I didn't use 20. I used two, because it's going so fast that in two years things are going to be different. What does that stand for, KDC? Anybody? Because believe it or not, those initials are very critical to everyone in the room. That's the human knowledge doubling curve. How fast we are doubling our knowledge as a species. 100 years ago, it used to be like 50 years to double our knowledge curve. Now, according to the experts that study this, especially because of the internet, you can go on Google, and even before putting in Google, you put just G in the search bar, it comes up Google. Just G. Every 12 hours, we are doubling our knowledge curve. So to be at this expo, and to listen to the product specialists, and the experts, and the speakers, and each other, and pick each other's brains, just like Andy said earlier, by the time you leave at the end of the day at this particular event, you're going to have all kinds of knowledge you did not have sitting here right now. From the whole group, not just the product specialists, not just the speakers, but you're going to exchange information with your peers sitting around and talking, hey, you know what I discovered out on a mouse job last week? I, I don't know, maybe it's me, but here's what I watched. We are homo sapiens, right? That means wise person. And we've been performing pest control services for thousands of years, not hundreds, thousands. And it goes way back, and it's really fascinating history. And we don't have time to take it all through that whole evolution. But when Andy asked me to do this, I said, he said, could you show us the path, at least in some kind of accelerated fashion, how we've gone from the early days to where we are now? So if we just take a quick look at this, we're going all the way back, 
3000 BC, taking these scriptures, where this translate says, O oh, Ashwini, kill the burrowing rodents, which devastate our food grains, cut their heads, break their necks, plug their mouths so they can never destroy our food. Please rid mankind of them. 3000 BC. Hieroglyphics and the Egyptians, 1500 BC. These are on, you know, cave walls and this kind of thing. These are pest control people back then being shown doing their services for the good of the peoples. It's not new. But as we begin to go forth and speed and, and super speed here, we jump in all kinds of years, but we all know the famous Rembrandt, right? If anybody owns an original Rembrandt, uh, you're pretty wealthy. <coughs> but Rembrandt, of all artists and what have you, is one of his most famous drawings. You'd have to get an original of this, you'd have to have a lot of money. But it's called The Rat Catcher, 1632 in Amsterdam. Making a living, killing and catching rats, and going from house to house doing it. And Rembrandt captured that as a sign of the times. Well then, of course, we have the famous Pied Piper, and Stan's going to chat about this a little bit more also. But we all, when people say to me, they say, what do you do for a living? I say, well, I'm a specialist in rodents. You know, especially I work with a lot of city rat programs, blah, blah, blah. And people always say to me, oh, you're like the Pied Piper. Like, yeah, I guess. Though I don't dress like that. Right? So it's a situation where this is off a postcard. This is actually representing what a myth started back in the plague time of the Pied Piper luring all the rats out of the areas and buildings and they all fall and walk into the sea where they all drown and this kind of thing. And there's a lot to this. This whole fable of milk goes on and on and on in literature. But nevertheless, and check out this. I, you know, this is by sheer mistake of this postcard. These two rats are here, but yet the bottom of that postcard don't shoot up. <laughs> so figure, these, these rats get it done, don't they, Stan? So, and then we have, and, and again, Stan may talk about this. This is the famous Jack Black and his dog and his ferrets, which service to the queen, going around killing rats. And as we probably know, maybe some of you are here today, Actually, well-trained dogs in the right situation are unbelievably effective at reducing rat populations under the right circumstances. Can't do it in every situation, but certainly when the tools match up, these animals, Jack Russell Terriers and other breeds, are outstanding. Outstanding. You know? Well, I think that's me back in uh, you know my early days. You know? But in the Parisian sewers, for example, they're full-time hired rat catchers put into those old sewers of Paris to capture and kill the rats. Now, I don't know about you all, how many people have actually been in the sewers of somewhere in the New York City area looking at rats? All right, I see one hand, two hands. It's, kind of, it's a different way to spend the day, I'm going to tell you, right? <laughs> you come up out of that manhole cover and people say, what are you doing down there? And you say, well, I'm actually controlling rats with poisons. And people actually try to get away from you. They step back, right? Very interesting. Keep your distance. All the rat traps, all the equipment, it's, you know, I don't know if Mandy has, with all especially has going on, maybe has a special on these, you know, for, for a case, of, but it's a giant trap just to capture a mouse. You know, then, and Stan, I will defer to you with, you know, glue technology. Here's a, here's a product going way back to the 1920s. Rat sticker. It just says, kill it, kill it, you know, this kind of thing. Notice it says, the non-poisonous rat and mouse catching compound supplies a long-felt want. I, I don't know, what, what is a long-felt want? <laughs> Is there, is there some, Bill, do you know? Long felt want, but either way, you get a long felt want. You know, it is a pest destroyer that is perfectly, not partially, perfectly harmless to use and handle, although it will kill that. Right, so 
you know, there it is, rat sticker. We are using advanced with the revolution, as you heard with Andy and others, you know, catch master, Atlantic paste and glue, and these, the glue technology, that whole business of glue technology, what goes into a glue, and most people have no idea, all I know is it's sticky. A lot goes into measuring glues and stickiness, and whether they hold up in heat and cold, and what happened. But we were there 100 years ago. Probably now with high technology. I would say, if anyone in this room does any work with rodents, this is mandatory homework assignment. And here's the thing. You never used to be able to get it off of Amazon. But it's become so popular, and it will, you'll see here, this is very misleading. June 1st, 2005, as if that's when it was published. This was written and published back in 1898. I read this in graduate school, a gift from a professor who said, you have to read this book, 1898, or this journal. This guy, for 25 years, did nothing but catch rats, and he recorded all his experiences, wrote them down, and put them in a journal. Things like Matthews. I, would, I will tell you, to this day, when I go out on rat consults, and I go out, and I'm out pretty regularly. I was just out the other day doing another neighborhood. I'm out, I like to be in the field. I still use this man's advice. Several pieces of it. What he discovered back in 1898, just from work in the field, 25 years of experience, he wasn't a college professor, he wasn't a PhD, he, wasn't, he didn't go through it. He just said, look, I've been doing this earnestly for 25 years, paying attention and being a keen observer to what I see out there with rats. And he wrote it down and shared it. To this day, some of the technology you see being sold right next door and the premise behind those devices actually was discovered in 1898. That's the truth, believe it or not. But I would say, you know, and you'll notice down here it says, many of the earliest sporting books, particularly those dating back to the 1800s, are now extremely scarce and very expensive. Kingdom, nothing. Yours for free. But I would say this, and I said this to my students at Purdue, 16 years I taught at Purdue, you must read this, it's an assignment, you will be held accountable come final exam. That's how good it is. It's an easy read, it's a fairly quick read, you'll do a lot of underscoring, but you will learn a lot about rats. This is a textbook I have, it's right off my shelf, I took this picture, 202 common household pets. Does anyone in the room know who that author is? 1939. Anybody? How about, how many people know the Malice Handbook? Now I see a bunch of hands going up. This was before Malice. This is Arnold Malice's copy of that book, from which I think Personally, he was inspired to do Malice. Now, this book never really caught on early on. In part, I read the whole history of this guy and everything in part because he had a cantankerous personality where just one of those people was just great at people. He would say things and anger them, and he made very few friends. But I will tell you, that is an outstanding book, no matter what his personality was. I go to that book pretty regularly, right off my shelf. And he has another book, Unwanted uh, Guest, also that's outstanding. So I'm taking this through this zoom zoom land, it's kind of where we're ending up as time goes by. Even, right, cartoons, what do they use? The big scary rats. What's fascinating about this to me, everybody, is that word shadows, power of shadows. And here is, you know, pray for the man in the rat hole. Well, that's how I felt in the sewers. I don't know how you feel when you sometimes have to go in basements and it's full of rats and you can smell them or what have you. Like, gee, where am I? <laughs> when I'm out doing surveys, sometimes people, that, you know, I'm in my vest and everything, I'm in a clipboard. People say, what are you doing? I say, I'm doing a rat survey. And what do you hear? You know, the rats in the alley up here in the Bronx are two pound giant rats. There is no two-pound rats anywhere in New York City, Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, there is none. 
And I will tell you this, and I've said this for many, many years, you bring me a two-pound rat, I have a check in my wallet, 500 bucks. Bring it. That's a thousand dollars. All right, I'm going to have to get a lawyer, I think. Okay, so the situation, though, you know, it's, these animals are always made into these monsters. But here's something that's critical. See that word shadows? When you do road inspections, People say, where's the best place to put traps and baits and blue boards and this kind of thing? The number one word that I use as a consultant after doing this for over 30 years, when I want to look for rodents, I don't look for it necessarily. Where's the droppings? Where's the droppings along the walls? I don't do that. I go on shadow inventory. Because rodents go from shadow to shadow to shadow. Outside they do it, inside they do it. Why? Because everybody wants to kill rodents. Fox want to kill them, dogs want to kill them, cats want to kill them, raccoons want to kill them, skunks want to kill them, hawks want to kill them, owls want to kill them. Everybody wants to kill them because they're a quick hit of protein. So if you're a prey species that's going shadow to shadow to shadow, you don't get seen so much. And this is why we often hear the homeowners say, you know, I'm glad you came to help me with the mouse problem, and I guess I should have called early because about a couple of weeks ago I saw something dark by the stove. I thought I saw something. When I looked, it wasn't there. Right, because the house mouse moves at seven feet per second into the shadows. So this cartoon without even, like this, this comic book without even realizing you used the word that if you get the 2019 National Geographic magazine where they covered rats, when you open it up, it will say, Into the Shadows, National Geographic. Where did they get that from? The research. It's a prey species, shadow to shadow. So if you want to be great in doing inspections, aerobic control, and great with putting down the equipment in the most protected places, which I'm going to talk about in a second here in our revolution, is think about where you're going to put it, and always think about shadows. Of course, back then, you can see right here, about 1890, this is how many early exterminators started. Holy cow, wouldn't that be real big these days? Try getting on the road from Fort Lee with that, saying, hey, I'm here to do some service. <laughs> but not too further along, here we are. OK, so it's, a, it's an early service vehicle with the horse, well-dressed, you know, man. Driver, if you will. Here's the guy in the back trying to hold the work. I, now, I don't know what he's holding, but I don't want to know what he's holding. <laughs> you know. but, but it's an interesting photograph, what have you. Here we are today. Here we are today. Now, where is this? This is research that's just been done a couple of years, like two years ago, where the scientists this is a Norway rat in there, a laboratory Norway rat, but still the same species what we have to go out and control. That's the rats of Medicus, where they train these rats to drive little cars. Yeah. Think about that. We underestimated, we understood these animals, we under everything with these animals. We now know that these animals plan, they can think, they can make decisions, and they even regret when they make bad decisions. They have regret. We now know that all through research in this revolution of knowledge, that's where we are. So when someone says, oh, it's just a varmint, like you saw in that glue trap, kill it. It's just a disgusting thing. Kill it. Not so simple. Rodents comprise one of the highest callback rates of all our pest groups. And we all know this. You don't have to say that to any New Yorker or any place. In New York and in the vicinity of New York and New Jersey, we live with rats at night. So you want to be so darn careful of giving a low ball price in the front end over the phone. Because that can eat you alive if you're not careful. So these animals, you know, they actually they can move the food all around this arena, and this rat has to look out the, the side windows, if you will, see where the food is. It has a steering wheel, it has to steer, and then it has to push a pedal to make the car go to the food. That's driving. 
So I don't know if there's going to be a Porsche model of this soon or what have you for the rats, but nevertheless, this is where we are in this evolution for evolution. We just zoom, zoom all the way through this. So here's our buddy. When I talk about rodents here, it's about rats and mice, of course. Now this is a typical looking, you know, average New York City Norway rat. We don't have the other species here except for, for occasional drop-in from the delivery here and there. So this is nothing, and I'm not talking about biology and behavior. We're not going to say, well, this is how long it lives, and this is how much it weighs, and this is, you know, its home range, and so forth and so on. That's a whole different deal. We're not doing that. But this animal is the animal that you can train to drive a little car. But you know what? It's the house mouse that is the second most successful mammal on planet Earth, the house mouse. We're number one. You know, I know we're here sometimes, you get to debate that, but nevertheless, <laughs> we're number one. House mouse is number two. It's not your dog, it's not your cat, it's not the whales, it's not the cute polar bear, it's the house mouse. So, now these names here, this is Kaylee Byers. I point that out because write that thing down. She is one of the most talented scientists going on rodents and rodent behavior and rodent control. Kaylee Byers. She's located out of British Columbia, out of Vancouver, which is called the Vancouver Rat Project. And her mentor and her main professor, before she graduated with a PhD, is Chelsea Hemsworth. Now, if you want to read some great research, all you have to do into the Google search box is put Byers Hemsworth, and you'll get a whole bunch of papers they published over the past eight years that are, in my opinion, among the best that ever hit the research publication list. Now, why do I show this? Is because they actually empirically measure what rodents still do to us as a species here in this evolution for evolution thing, as we evolve through it. They were able to actually conduct a study empirically and show still to this day, rodents' impacts extend beyond their damage that they do. Living with rodents can elicit fear, anger, stress, worry, exhaustion, sleep disturbance, and avoidance behavior of each other, you and I. Avoidance behavior. You know, you get up maybe with a spouse or a child or you have a friend next door and they're like grumpy and like, leave me alone. It's like, what, what's with you? Get up on the wrong side of the bed? What's the deal? No, but I heard rats scratching in the wall all night. Of course, that's big time real in New York City. Multi-family housing of all types. I just inspected a very, very expensive apartment on Madison Avenue two weeks ago from ICE. And they brought me in because the person who lives there overlooks the city, very famous, blah, 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 that's money. And they say, you better take care of this. I heard you're the mouse man. I'm like, yeah, I'm the mouse man. Because <laughs> we are tired of every once in a while I've seen a mouse scurry out from no place. We've had like three different pest control professionals all saying they could do it. We're still seeing them. Now, one of the pest control companies said to me, you know what, I, I, you know, Bobby, I, th I think it's, ooh, I think it's like this. I said, well, let's see, maybe it is the illusory parasitosis. Because that happens with rodents, right, Bill? So it's a situation after I got done for about an hour and a half of inspecting this just one unit on the top of a very fancy building in Madison Avenue, my report said, yup, they're seeing mice. <laughs> but they're not living inside the unit. They're visiting. And when I showed them the spots they were actually getting through, they're like, there's no way mice can get through those spots. They had a contractor and I said, nope, they're getting in. And I'll prove it to you because I scraped the little mouse hairs off the little tiny cracks and crevices that they were squeezing in and leaving a pheromone for other mice from down below other stories getting in. Follow them chase. They were getting in following their nose, and then saying, you know, not much going on up here, I'll go back downstairs. But they showed up. One time during a dinner party with some pretty famous people. Now that really triggered everything. Bring in the mouse man. 
So we know, as we started out, but we have to remind ourselves, right? We talked about starting off and said, you know, it's all about being essential, so forth and so on. Okay, essential or not, forget the essential. We've been doing this for thousands of years. We've been protecting the food, health, and safety of most every single client you go in and service. In some cases, it's they're anomalies and they even fall into this group, so what? So I don't use every single one. But the critical point where you're going today, we're all going today, is through what we learn today and interacting with each other, is we're not being paid to put down a glue trap or a base station or spray a baseboard or spread something. We're not being paid for that specifically. We're being paid pay because you're supposed to be an observer. You're being paid to have eyes that they do not see. When I went in to do that mouse job in that very expensive unit, they're like, I, I just can't believe you found that stuff. I said, well, I've been practicing my observation skills for over 30 years. If I can't do this, what the heck do you need me for? Also, is it's an even playing field. No matter who you are, what you do, what your occupation is, if you're here today, if you're anything to do with pest management, it doesn't matter which spot in pest management, the dignity remains even across the board. If I'm in a sewer hanging up bait to control rats, for me, I'm no different than the mayor sitting there talking about the sewers of how we're going to fund them. We both have a job to do. That mayor has his job to do to make sure we can get to that spot in the sewer, and I have a job to do when I get in that sewer. So why do I hear, well, I'm the mayor, you're the sewer rat guy. Well, you can call me whatever you want, but we're equal. <laughs> so where lies this revolution, you guys? It is within the K. And I'm going to shift over to the T in a second of technology, just to set the stage for the following speakers. You know, but we're talking about, it's within the knowledge curve. It's, we are trained to see what others overlook. We're not better at putting down a sticky board in somebody's basement that they can go buy at the Home Depot and put it down themselves. We're not better at that necessarily, although we would be. But so there's a certain way you put down a boot trap that is very critical because you're going to hear from Stan. Well, if we look at this, we have a mouse, of course, and a pink cat. And we open that up and say, well, look at that. We have two mice. We have two mice here in the pink cat. I wonder why we put two. Blah, blah, blah. The whole behavioral mechanism behind what happened here before it happened is complex. Let me get rid of a myth that perhaps you, you've known to get rid of. I used to tell all my customers, you know, I'm going to put this trap down. It's a multi-catch trap. And, you know, I called it a curiosity trap on my route for three years. Curiosity trap. And they'd say, why do you call that a curiosity trap? I said, well, because all mice are curious. And they must go in here because they're so like, I wonder what's in there. I'm going in. I'm so curious. That's not true. But that's what I was trained. We now know through the knowledge curve, if you will, and research, that some mice tend to be investigative and some will never go in this trap. We even really have been rocking the world of like, you know, I'm not so sure a trap on both sides of the doors is absolutely the, bar, the end all of protecting a food plant or any other place. Mice will come into a, a door, we've captured them on film, they'll go right by these traps next to the doors, and sometimes they'll stop and sometimes they'll go in. Do they help? Yes. Is it guaranteed? No. So, this within the knowledge curve of today, when people ask me, no, can we design a robot control program? Can we hire you to design this robot control program, the general program for our entire city? I get that often. I work on that. I do work with cities at that level. I said, there's not going to be any standard. I can't copy New York City's program and give it to you out here in, in Poland. You need a whole new program. It'll have similarities. But there is no standard road and column. Now, what that means, and this is especially true in New York, is that animal has all kinds of variations depending on where it was born. So if we go back to my neighborhood where I was born in Brooklyn in East Flatbush area, and we have a rat problem in the alleyway in 